It is interesting. It's, it's fun even to, to speculate on the next life. It, it is neat thinking about animals that we love and whether or not there will be animals in heaven. But when it comes to people that we love, the concerns, they become much more intense. And today what I want to do is consider some of the most frequently asked questions about heaven that I hear. And while I don't want to necessarily be dogmatic, I do believe the scriptures give us enough insight to be a great encouragement to us. The first question will take me the longest amount of time to deal with, so I want you to just hang with me through this, this time. Here, here's the question. Where do the righteous go when they die? I am asked this question often. Now, in the Old Testament, the abode of the dead is called Sheol. Look at Psalm 89, verse 48. It says, What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? That is the New American Standard translation, but most of your Bibles will just say the power of the grave. And often when you see that phrase, the grave, in your Old Testament, the actual Hebrew word is Sheol. Sheol was the place where all of the dead went. Now, the Greek term, the New Testament side of this, the Greek term for Sheol is Hades. And the Hebrews came to understand that, that Sheol or Hades was the intermediate abode of the dead and it was made up of two different realms. One realm was called Paradise and the other was called Tartarus. Paradise was for the righteous and Tartarus was for the wicked. Jesus seems to reinforce this view when he told the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Remember, Lazarus died and he went to Abraham's bosom and the rich man went to a place of Torment. Jesus also told the thief on the cross when they were dying, Today you will be with me in paradise. So it's clear at this point it does not appear that paradise and heaven were the same place. Jesus was not in heaven the three days he went, uh, the three days between Calvary and Easter. We, we know he preached to the spirits in prison, it says in 1 Peter 3, but also when he arose from the dead and Mary wanted to grab him, remember what he said in John 20, verse 17. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Apparently, the saints in the Old Testament could not go to heaven and live in God's presence until their sins were atoned for. Because it says in Hebrews that before Christ died, it was a time of forbearance for the sins, not a time of forgiveness until Calvary happened. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. Now, they weren't in a time of torment. They were in a place that Jesus referred to as Abraham's bosom. But until their sins were atoned for, they could not yet enter into the presence of God. Maybe this is what Paul was alluding to in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, when he said that when Jesus ascended, he took with him captives into heaven. Jesus says that he is now the owner of death and Hades. When he conquered death, he earned the right to open the door to Sheol. And when he did, he released the righteous saints who had been waiting there. 
And so after Jesus' ascension, it is interesting from that point on, paradise and heaven are in the same place. So Paul can say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. It's also interesting, after Jesus' ascension, from that point on in the New Testament, the righteous dead are always referred to as being in heaven. Now, some of you are already ahead of me, and you're thinking, now, wait a minute. Last time you said heaven was going to be the new earth, and that won't happen until Jesus appears again and we get our new bodies. How can saints be in heaven if Jesus hasn't come back? Well, there is a heaven. It is the heaven that one day will come to earth. Now, that heaven exists in a spiritual dimension of reality which God has hidden from us where Jesus now lives in his resurrected body. I believe what happens when the righteous die is their spirits immediately upon death go to this heaven to, as Paul puts it, to be with Christ. By the way, nowhere does the Bible ever talk about the resurrection of spirits. Just the resurrection of the body. Remember, while Stephen was being murdered in the book of Acts, the Bible says that he, he saw heaven opened and saw Jesus standing there at the right hand of God. In Acts chapter 7, verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, what some people say, because death in the Bible is referred to at times as sleep, is that when we die, we go to sleep. When you're asleep, you don't know how long you're asleep. You just wake up and they say that's how it's going to be. That is certainly what Jehovah's Witnesses believe and others, and that view fails to reckon with scriptures that imply there is a waiting time between the death of a righteous person and the return of Jesus. Look at Revelation chapter 6, when he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true? until you judge the inhabitants of the, of, of the earth and avenge our blood. Notice it says, I saw the souls of the martyrs. These martyred saints are clearly not asleep. And while their present state is secure, their future victory is assured, and they are clearly anticipating with eagerness the full vindication of their lives. They are in heaven, but they're waiting for something more. Look with, me, look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and see if you catch a very interesting, uh, seemingly contradiction in this text. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 14. It says, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns... God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still alive when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. How are they going to rise from the grave if they had already come back with Jesus? What is going to happen is that the spirits who are in heaven 
are going to come back with Jesus and the resurrected glorified bodies are going to be raised and we will receive our glorified bodies at the return of Jesus. The earth is going to be purged with fire and we will return to the new earth. So when I preach a funeral, I do not have any qualms about uh, saying of a righteous saint, they are now in heaven. At my death, my spirit will immediately go to be with Christ. There will be no layover in Hades. It will be the best day that I've ever lived, but it will not be the best day I will ever live. That will come when Jesus returns and I receive my glorified body. Now that is a whole lot to chew on. So if you want to check out uh, for the rest of this sermon, I guess you, you do have my permission. But if you want to hang with me, I have a few more questions to go through. Here's another one that we can look at. Do people in heaven know what we are doing? I'm asked this all the time. Well, we have already seen the saints in Revelation 6 who wanted God to judge the earth. We know that they have more than just a passive interest in the affairs of the earth. What do we know about what people in heaven know? Well, we know that they know the activities of the wicked and of the evil acts done by the persecutors of the church. They know what is being done by unrighteous men and they long for vindication. I think they know when a sinner repents and they rejoice about it. Look with me at a verse in Luke 15 and I'm going to give you an old verse with a new twist because a lot of you have read this verse for years and you missed exactly what this verse says. Luke 15, in the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, typically, we read that and we say, that means the angels rejoice, and I am sure that they do. We've all said, when someone gets baptized, right now, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. I'm sure they are. But what does the verse actually say? Look again, verse 10. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Who is rejoicing in the presence of the angels? I think it is the righteous saints who are with the Lord Jesus. I'll tell you what else they know. They watch us as we run the Christian race. As the Hebrew writer in chapter 11 mentions all the heroes of the faith who were longing for a heavenly city. He says in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And the image that he created that the early reader would have understood was a big Greek or Roman arena. All the people would have been up in the stands and the runners were, were out in the field running in the lines that had been marked out for them. And what he is saying is we've got all of these witnesses in the stands that are watching us run. Now, you all love that sports... Uh, no, in, in sports, you know that there is such a thing as home field advantage. There's, there's something about playing better, where all the people that, that love you are watching you play. And what he is saying is, we actually have that advantage. We ought to be motivated to greater faithfulness when we think of all of the righteous saints, especially your loved ones, who are watching you run and cheering you on. Now let me just add one word of warning. I do believe the righteous in heaven are very aware of what we are doing. However, Scripture clearly warns the believer against ever trying to contact those who have died. I know in grief, when you have lost someone you really love, you are very susceptible to a temptation to someone who says, I can get you in touch with them. These people, called mediums, traffic in the realm of demons, and they come under some of the harshest judgments 
in Scripture. And if you play with palm readers and tarot cards and, and read your horoscopes, and you think that's no big deal, I'm telling you as your pastor, as your teacher, stay away from that stuff. It is demonic, and Scripture is very clear that we are not to try to contact the dead. Another question that we want to address this morning, will we know each other in heaven? The Bible says that each person who will inherit salvation is carefully listed by name in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus alludes to this when the 70 come back from their first preaching mission in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus said that we will sit down and eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Do you remember the transfiguration account? Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus on the side of the mountain, and they have clearly kept their identities when they appear with Jesus. And the interesting thing is that the disciples immediately recognize who these men are. How did they do that? I mean, they weren't wearing name tags, Moses or Elijah. I believe that we will know each other in heaven. I can't fathom the father gathering his family together as total strangers. Paul clearly expects to know and to enjoy his converts in heaven. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Then on the day when the Lord Jesus returns, you will be proud of us in the same way that we are proud of you. I believe that we will be reunited with saints that we loved. We will be introduced to saints that we admire and we will have a new earth full of friends that we can make. W.A. Criswell, the great esteemed pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, was asked one time, will we know each other in heaven? And he said, we will not really know each other until we get to heaven. Another question that I want us to address this morning. What about children in heaven? These, these last three questions, by the way, can get very personal. Everyone who has been to the funeral of a child, especially if it was yours, has wondered about this. The Bible makes no reference to babies or children in heaven. It is reasonable to assume that God will permit children who die to spend eternity in a more mature state. Most likely at the resurrection of a child, they will receive the glorified body that will reflect who it was that they would have become. We've all been to funerals of a child where someone says something like this, I can just see that baby now up there in, in Grandpa Joe's lap. And that may be a very comforting thought, but I do not think that the person that baby would have been will be in heaven. You see, I believe aborted fetuses will be in heaven. The life God intended will not be denied its destiny because of a choice that a person didn't have a right to make back here on earth. I don't believe that they will be in heaven as a fetus, but as the person that God created them to be, and they will be spending eternity with the Lord Jesus. How old was Adam when God created him? Well, you could say that he was one day old, but he would have appeared as, as this young, dynamic man. You see, I believe that when we get to heaven, our bodies are going to reflect that image. For example, I never saw or remember my grandmother as an, uh, except as an elderly woman. And, and while I long to see my grandmother again, I do not think that is how she will be in heaven. I think that she will be more like the picture that she was when she was in her prime in her youth. That is the woman that my grandfather fell in love with. 
And I believe that we will inherit new bodies, young and old, that will be at our maximum capacity to enjoy eternity. God loves children too much to let them spend eternity unable to enjoy heaven or himself at their fullest potential. And that brings another important question. Why will there be no marriage in heaven? Well, let's go back and read what Jesus said. Remember the Sadducees who had a God so small that they did not believe in the resurrection. So, so they gave Jesus this riddle of a woman that married seven different men and they wondered who she would be married to in the next life. And look at Jesus' response in Luke chapter 20. Jesus replied, Marriage is for people here on earth, but in the coming age, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they will never die again. In this respect, they will be like angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. Now, let me be very clear about something. Jesus is not saying that we will be angels. Nor is he saying that we will be genderless clones in heaven. Heaven will have a place for maleness and femaleness, but not for marriage. Why not? I can only speculate. For one thing, procreation will no longer be expected. When God made Adam and Eve, he told them to multiply and to fill up the earth with more people. And I believe in heaven, the number of saints, just like the number of angels, will be eternally fixed. Another thing, marriage's function is a signpost that no longer really is needed. That is what marriage is. It is, it is a, a signpost. Paul says in Ephesians 5 that when a man and a woman become one flesh, they are illustrating the mystery of Christ and his commitment to his church. And that is one of the purposes of marriage. And it is one reason why Satan is so busy, by the way, attacking marriage. He is trying to destroy that picture. But in heaven, that picture is not going to be necessary anymore. And finally, it needs to be remembered that one of marriage's chief functions was to help men and help women get to heaven. Isn't that ultimately the measure of a successful marriage? When everything else is considered, a successful marriage is a marriage where a man and a woman help each other get to heaven. Now, I think this is one of the most upsetting thoughts about heaven, and I can understand why. Most of us in this room have lived many, many years with a person that we deeply love, and the thought of that being eternally ended is disconcerting to us. How can it be heaven without my mate? Well, my thought on that is that the end of a partnership does not mean the end of a deep relationship. Jesus was sinless, and he loved everybody. But he held a deep affection for some more than others. Some were closer to Jesus than others were. And I believe the new earth will include the new brotherhood of man, but that does not exclude the existence of special relationships. I suspect for all of eternity, my wife and I will have a very deep bond unlike those I'll have with almost anyone else in heaven. And then I'm just going to say it because you're thinking it anyway. How can it be heaven without sex? Do we really think heaven will be a place of less pleasure than earth? In heaven, all of our desires are going to be good desires. And none of them will be frustrated. Perhaps there are joys that are far greater than sexual fulfillment that God has in store for us. Besides, there will be marriage in heaven. Jesus will be the bridegroom. We will be the bride. And somehow I don't think we're going to find that disappointing. And the final and maybe the hardest question to deal with this morning is this. How can it be heaven if my loved ones aren't there? The Bible says, that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus is happy in heaven. 
even though multitudes whom he loves will not spend eternity with him. How can this be? Perhaps the glories of the next, will, the next life will simply overwhelm any memories of this life. Look at Isaiah 65. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Another thing to consider is that in the next world, we will come to so much more mature and understanding of the justice of God that we presently hold on to. And we will unflinchingly affirm all of his judgments as we stand before God and we marvel at his absolute holiness and his righteousness and his purity. We will not question the judgment of God or wonder how he could send anybody to hell. We will be overwhelmed by grace and we will marvel at how he could, could have sent anybody to heaven. And remember, God himself said that he would see to it that nobody in heaven will grieve. He himself will wipe away our tears and there will be no more crying and there will be no more sorrow. And God keeps his promises. Now, these are hard questions and I, I don't pretend to have all of the answers, but I do know that the God of heaven is bigger than any of our concerns or questions about heaven. During World War II, the King of England ordered an evacuation of children from the bomb-torn areas of London. So many ch parents took their children to trains where they could be taken to safer parts of the country to wait out the worst parts of the war. The story is told of a mother and father that puts their young son and daughter on one of these trains and as it takes off, the little girl starts to cry because she's scared. She has no idea where she's about to go and brushing away his own tears, the little boy puts his arm around his sister and he says, I don't know where we're going either, but the king knows, so don't worry. And that's the best answer that I can give when we have questions about heaven. The God of the Sadducees was way too small. When we all get to heaven, and see how great our God is, I think we're going to have all of the answers that we need. I want you to stand up and let's sing this great hymn together this morning.